by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. <laughs> by faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. And what more shall I say, for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah also, and of David and of Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, attained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, women received their dead raised to life again. Now, if, if we look at this, so, cause as we go through this today, I want you to see that God uses ordinary men and women. None of those men that I said here were born with an S on their chest. None of them were born with some sort of supernatural power that gave them the ability over anyone else. Now, as they lived and they submitted and surrendered to God, they obtained an anointing. But under, even if you look at the life of David, David did not anoint himself. David was chosen, and evidently he was chosen not because he was best, he was chosen because it was a heart. Because we know why he didn't choose Eliab in, in 1 Samuel 16, because he was head and shoulders above all the rest. And God tells him, he goes, man looks on the outward, but God looks on the heart. So evidently, everything you being and doing and being used God by God has everything to do with your heart. It's a heart position. It's amazing that God can take something ordinary, something ordinary, and make it supernatural. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah! <laughs> so, now, now, wait a minute. Now, now, that can, because I'm doing something in faith, you can, you can sense God's presence... But think about this for a moment, that God took something ordinary like a shout and it caused the walls of the biggest city of that time to fall down. God could take something like a sling and a stone and kill a giant with it. God could take a staff made of wood and part a Red Sea with it. God has the ability to take something that's simple and ordinary and make something extraordinary out of it. He has the ability to take four leprous men's foot, footsteps and make them sound like an army. God chooses, God chose, according to the Apostle Paul, chose to use the foolishness of preaching to set people free. I'm not the one that called it foolishness, Paul did. <laughs> Just the simplicity of just speaking a word at the right time has the ability to totally revolutionize someone's thought process. Yes. Yes. Never think that your voice doesn't carry weight or carry power. Yes, sir. We see in the book of Samuel, it tells us that the, the one, the anointing, it said that as he would speak, not one word would fall to the ground. God can take something, something, and make it extraordinary. He took five loaves and two fish and fed well over 5,000 people. It said 5,000 men and women and children, not including women and children. And there were baskets left over. It wasn't some sort of special fish, and it wasn't some sort of special loaf of bread. But it was something that was in the hand of God. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Amen. See, it's when it touches the hand of God that can all of a sudden make it extraordinary. Yes, sir. 
God has the ability to amplify your voice when you think your voice is, is small. There's power in your testimony. You may think your testimony is insignificant. You may think of where you came from as insignificant. But I'm telling you, when you speak your testimony on behalf of God, I'm telling you, God can, God can take that testimony and win the masses with it. Hallelujah. Amen. God had the ability with Rahab to take one little red string in her, in her doorpost that, that caused the whole Jericho walls to fall down, but her side didn't. I want to encourage you, go back and, and find, there's, there's some things that Annette and I have watched. It's called, it's called uh, the, the pattern, it's called the, the pattern of the evidence, I think. And they went back and actually researched Jericho and they went and when they dug and excavated around it, everything was falling flat but this one section. And that's the only thing that we can make sense that it was where Rahab lived. That part of the wall did not fall down. Why? Because God took something simple like a red thread that actually represents the bloodline of Jesus and caused her to be safe. You can see Jephthah, and you be like, well, who is Jephthah? How did he make Hebrews chapter 11? His mom was a prostitute. His mom was a prostitute. He thought he was nothing. He came from nothing, but yet he ended up, ended up being connected with Deborah, which was the, which is the judge, and the fact that he won great battles. Why? Because even though he came from a prostitute, he still had faith and trusted God, even though in the natural, he was little. We can look at Gideon, and, and we know that he even said this, that I'm, I'm the least in my father's house. I'm from the smallest clan, and I'm least in my father's house. But God said, you mighty man of valor. And 300 men defeated, defeated hundreds of thousands of men because God can take something small. He can take something in the natural that looks ordinary and make it extraordinary. Don't talk yourself out of the dream that God gave you because you think it's small. Don't talk yourself out of the dream and the legacy that God has spoken to you because you think your voice won't matter. Because maybe it's your voice that only someone will be able to hear and receive from. Someone's waiting for your voice. Someone's waiting for your obedience. Someone's waiting for your boldness. Someone's waiting for your courage. But you have to come to a place and realize as a man and a woman of legacy, I am a weapon in God's hand that God wants to use. Hallelujah. To speak to the enemy in the gates. That's what Psalms 127 is. Let's read that. And get too far ahead of myself. You're learning to communicate sometimes. This is like, Lord, when do I teach and when do I preach? <laughs> this is one of our key scriptures about legacy. Verse 3 says, Behold, children are a heritage. Say, say heritage. heritage. Now say legacy. legacy. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. A lot of times you can look at the fruit of the womb as being a reward, looking at... Looking at the children I have are a reward for my life, but understanding maybe your children are a reward for someone else's life. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Hallelujah. 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 Your children are called to more than just you. Hallelujah. I pray that our children and grandchildren do far more than ever Justin and that ever do, ever do. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. I, I'm praying for the young people in this church and praying for those that are under me, under me, do more than I ever did. And as leaders, as leaders, we need to make sure we don't get intimidated by, by the next generation. And let's be, Abra let be an Abraham that releases an Isaac that releases a Jacob. Hallelujah. 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 We need all three generations. We need everyone in these last days. Hallelujah. 
You say, well, I'm, I, I'm the Joshua generation. Well, I just have this one question to you. Make sure if you're the Joshua generation that you do what Joshua did. And what Joshua did is, is he chose to be when no one else is. Joshua chose to be halfway up the mountain serving the man of God. So don't try to be a Joshua if you haven't chose to serve the man of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because when you serve the man of God, the anointing, it says in, in, in Deuteronomy 29, it said, told, told God, said, go to Joshua and lay your hands on him and impart your spirit to him. Yes, Hallelujah. That's good. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Someone needs to hear that. That's not in my notes today, but some, we need to hear this today. Amen. Because, because this is all about legacy. This is about legacy. And it goes on and it says this. It says, like an arrow, like an arrow in the hand of a warrior. So it's comparing these children. These children, these legacy are arrows in the hand of a warrior. So are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who have his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with their enemy in the gate. And that means they'll warn and threaten and tell the enemy to get out of their city. Hallelujah. 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 You and I, we are arrows in the hand of the Lord. Yes. We are arrows in the hand of the Lord. You are an arrow, whether you realize it or not, whether you are in the, in the midst of the darkest season and time of your life, it doesn't change, it doesn't really, it doesn't change the assignment on your life. You have an assignment on your life. You have a target to hit. We looked at Isaiah 49 last week and we talked about this, that from my mother's womb, you concealed me. And I am like a, I'm like a polished arrow, a polished arrow. Thank you, Father. It says, he made me a polished arrow in his quiver as he kept me close and concealed me. Let's go to Ephesians chapter two. Ephesians chapter two. We looked at verse 10 last week. Let's look at verse 8. Let's start at verse 8 this week. For by grace you have been saved through faith in that not of yourselves. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. By grace are you saved through faith in that not of yourselves. Remember, faith is found in your choosing. It's in the choosing where the blessing and favor of God flows. So, so it, it's like I can understand, I can hear about salvation, but until I choose, until I choose him. By grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. What is it? It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Yes. Amen. Next verse, four. 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 Now, it's a preposition. And I can actually change this word for to the word because. Because if we don't understand, we, we under, have to understand that I've been saved more. I've been saved for more than just going to heaven one day. I'm grateful for that. Aren't you? Amen. I celebrate that. I, I'm expecting Jesus' return any day, any moment. But we've been saved by, by grace through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God because, because we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good work. So you ha you've been saved for a purpose. If it was all about going to heaven, then we should accept Jesus and immediately take us out of here. But you've been saved for purpose. Say that, I've been saved for purpose. for purpose. You see, you were saved by, 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 by grace through faith, not out of yourselves, for you are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for, because of good works. That word good there means distinguished. Distinguished works. There's things that God's calling you to do that I'll never do. Dennis O'Neill over here is a professor at uh, UNT, and he teaches, teaches uh, theater. He's, he, he's called to reach a whole other world that I'm not called to reach. 
but God's anointed him and favored him and, and, and given him influence in that arena for a long time. And I believe that influence will continue to grow and expand. You get Steve Martin and Summer, they, they have a business. And, and next thing I know, the Lord's telling them to start a roofing company and start this. I was like, I didn't know you did that. <laughs> They're like, we didn't either. <laughs> But they have anointings and giftings on their life because they want, they want to not just be a, be a blessing to people, but they also want to increase and fund the kingdom of God. I, I can look across this, this room and I, and I see the, the giftings in, in Phelan and Natalie's life to, to, to reach young people, reach the next generation, but also self-defense and, and, and what God's gifted you with, with, with martial arts and, and the talents that each one of you have, your ta talents with, with music. You know, I look at Justin and Jennifer and her heart for law and Justin's ability to put in excellent windows I look at all these different pe people across this room and, and see different gifts and different talents and, and that are equipped for something, and, and it, but it's for the kingdom. Whether it's natural, you think it's natural or not, is besides the point, it's spiritual. Yes, sir. It's spiritual. I don't carry a greater anointing upon my life because I have the title pastor in front of me. If I had that thought, then I should not be up here because I, I have to determine that I can only operate in this gifting office because it's the gift and grace upon my life, not because Justin had an idea one day, I think I'm going to pastor. <laughs> but you are, we are saved for something. That means as a child of God, you have a legacy. And that legacy isn't about necessarily about a pulpit. Maybe it is for you. But you were saved for legacy. Because you are an arrow. You are an instrument in the hand of God. God is looking for some men and women that will just be open and say, God, here I am, send me. That's what a person of legacy does. A person of legacy doesn't wait for someone to give them a position. A person of legacy doesn't, doesn't wait for a place to preach. Dr. Savell knew on, his, on the inside of his heart that, that he had a calling upon his life and no one wanted to hear a word he had to say. So he hit the streets and stood outside of, 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 of bars and would witness to every drunk that would come out and witness them until, until they accepted Jesus. Him and Miss Carolyn, you know, at the church they, they were a part of, they, they all of a sudden um, all started having a ministry in favor with ministering to the hippies and the drug addicts, and the prostitutes in, in the city of Shreveport, Louisiana. God said, start a Bible study. All of a sudden, the room's full of hippies, full of people needing to get set free. And, and, and it wasn't about someone, you know, trying to control. what they, they were just following legacy. They were just following what was on the inside of their heart. No one was saying, do, do you think you can really do something like that? Well, the thing is, it's just following God. It's just following God. Yes, yes. That's good. Thank you, Father. We're his workmanship created for good works. He's looking for men and women of God. Yes, yes. We won't turn there just for the sake of time, but just talking in my heart this morning, I, I, I think of Ezekiel 22. In Ezekiel 22, it's to me one of a, a sad scripture. But if you understand Ezekiel 22, the priests were trying to build temples. And it said they were using untempered mortar, meaning they were trying to find a shortcut. The priests were trying to find a shortcut to build something for God. It goes in and it says all the people were robbing each other. They were, they were stealing. And all the while, then the next verse after that, it says, God said, behold, I saw a man 
that can stand, at, uh, stand in the gap and make up the hedges. But one of the saddest statements is God said, I couldn't find one. That's one of the saddest verses in the Bible that God was looking for someone but couldn't find them. Wow. Yeah. That makes me, that makes me really want to press into God and say, God, I don't want to be out of place. I don't want to be out of place. I, you're looking for it, but you couldn't find it. Second Chronicles 16, 9 tells us this. It says he looks throughout the whole earth looking for someone's heart that's turned towards him. All he was doing was trying to look for someone that he could stand in the gap and make up the hedges, make up the difference. God's saying, I'm trying to do something for my people. I'm trying to do something for the children of Israel, but I can't find anyone. Can he find you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Will you be that man? Will you be that woman? Yes. Thank you, Lord. A person of legacy is determined to say, I'll be your man. I'll be your woman. Whatever it is, God. He's looking, you know, he it didn't say, I'm looking for an angel. I'm looking for a man. <laughs> I'm looking for a man. There's some things that God has limited himself, and some people, this might be kicking over a sacred cow for some people. There's some things that God is only limited to us by us. Well, I thought God is ultimately sovereign. How come you didn't get saved sooner? My Lord, bless him, Lord. Speak, Lord. How come, if God is ultimately sovereign, how come you're not praying for the people that God told you to pray for? If God is ultimately sovereign, how come he still can't get you to tithe? Bless him, Lord. I mean, that's the reality of it. So you have to say he's, he, there's something, now, he, now he, may ha, he may have to look for another person because Justin wouldn't do it. I'm not saying he, he's, he's not going to get the job done. He's going to have to find someone else to do it. I remember Happy Caldwell that passed a great church in Little Rock, Arkansas, and he, he gets there and, and he steps into this role of pastoring Agape Church in Little Rock. And the Holy Spirit told him, he goes, you were my seventh choice. Now, I don't like the sound of that. <laughs> I was seven, but, but God told me, he goes, he goes, I've tried to get seven other people to establish a church like this in Little Rock. But they kept, once they got to a certain point, they let people run, run, take them in another direction. They, pride took over or they, you know, they, they, they wanted the notoriety or they wanted this or they wanted that. And I couldn't find anyone that would just do what I'm telling, asking them to do. God's looking for a man. He's looking for someone like you and me because he can take something ordinary and make something extraordinary out of it. You know, we talked about Abraham last week that we, we can celebrate the blessing coming in and bless, we can celebrate the fact that I'll make your name great and I'll, I'll do all these great things through you. But it wasn't until Abraham chose to depart that God, then God was able to do something with his life. Thank you, Lord. How do you want me to say that? Yeah. Mm, thank you, Lord. Living by faith is living and seeing a future yes. that you may never actually see with ease. Come on. A life of faith is living for a future you may not ever see. Come on. Amen. 
Think about that. I just heard that statement. I was back there. Living by faith is living, living with the future you may never actually see. Lord, help, help me with some chapter and verse, Lord. Go to Exodus 2. Exodus 2. Yes, Lord. Exodus 2. Verse 23. Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died... And then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage and they cried out and their cry came up to God because of their bondage. So God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with who? With Isaac and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel and God acknowledged them. God said, I heard their cry. I've seen, I've seen the oppression. And if you keep going, reading throughout chapter three, God actually makes a statement. He goes, I will come down and I will deliver them. But wait a minute, who delivered them? God did, but he used a man. God delivered them, but he was looking for a man. But he heard their cry because of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So Abraham had to walk by faith and live by faith because God told him at the end of his life that your people are going to be in bondage for 400 years. So Abraham was being a father in the faith and seeing I'm going to be the father of many nations, but not, even, not being able to see our day necessarily in the natural. So he had to live by faith saying, God, I'm going to do my part as long as I'm breathing, living and breathing on this earth, and you're going to, do, you're going to have to take up where I left off. Yes. That's how legacy lives. That's how legacy lives, that I'm living and doing what God told me to do, and when I leave this earth, someone's going to, there's people going to behind me, and they're going to take up where I left off. Yes. That's legacy. Yes. Because legacy is bigger than you. Legacy is bigger than your kingdom. <laughs> Legacy is about his kingdom. So he was looking for a man and he had to find Moses. Man. Yet Elisha, Elisha's out in the wilderness. He was being fed by ravens. And all of a sudden, the, the brook dried up, and God said, hey, go, there's a, there's a widow woman. Yeah. And she's going to provide for you. So we had ravens providing for him. So God still had to use a something yes, <laughs> to do a something. So he used a woman, a widow woman. You know the story? I'm just going to bake a cake and me and the lad are going to die. But you have to understand, they, this was a win-win for the woman because they were, they were each other's answer. She met his need, but he brought abundance to her. But he used a man and he used a woman. The Apostle Paul has an encounter on the road to Damascus. Angel shows up, bright light, glory of God, who are you, Lord? But yet, if you go to Acts chapter 9, it says he sought a man, and he, told, he, he looked for a man named Ananias. God speaks to Ananias and says, Ananias, go to a street called Straight, and there the apostle Paul is, and I want you to go tell him all the things that shall befall him. So he used a man to be obedient to speak to a man of God that propelled that man of God into his destiny. That's good. That's good. Yeah. You and I, we are people 
of legacy. We are people of legacy. Thank you, Father. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Mm. Thank you, Father. Yes, Lord. Yeah. 2001. I'll tell this story, I think, in the close. In 2001, I had the opportunity to go to Israel. Some of you may have heard this story. I I just wasn't planning on telling the story, but I believe I'm supposed to as we start to close. Because you can see yourself as insignificant based on how you're currently living or how you lived, where you came from, whatever the enemy wants to use to keep you in a small box. And uh, I remember it was was May. It was May of 2001. I had the chance to go to Israel with the school. And we were over there. We were there for a little over two weeks. Uh, we spent the first week in, in, uh, in Galilee and toward all those places. Then we went to Jerusalem and we stayed at the Sheraton Hotel in, in, uh, in Jerusalem. And each day we would take different trips you know, to different locations. And uh, this particular location we went for one day, we went to uh, the Cave of Adullam, the Dead Sea. Cave of Adullam is where, where David had encounters with Saul. Um, we went to Megiddo. It's where... where uh, Armageddon is going to be, um, all these different places. And when we were in this one place, we went to the Valley of Elah. And how many people know where the Valley of Elah is? Heard, have you heard of the Valley of Elah? Anyone? Okay, a few hands there. It's where David fought Goliath. And so we are, we're here on this valley and, and we're walking, we're, we're walking from one side. It's a huge, it's a huge area. It's a huge place. So when you see it, you're like, man, you, you think like there's this, this, this little group of people that are here and, you know, fighting with these. No, this was, this was a huge span of, of land. And I remember going, going by and we're walking, we're walking through the field and we come by a brook. And, and I remember looking and just the Holy Spirit kind of said to me, I actually kind of asked the question. It was like, maybe this was the brook where David find, found five smooth stones. See, when you, when you go there and it kind of brings it, makes it alive to you. And I remember I, and so, you know, of course, I, I picked up five stones. <laughs> Not because there was any Goliath there, but, but you know, it's five stones. And I remember just walking in, you know, our, our leaders, every time we would go to a different place, they would, they would teach us. We had a, we had a, a book they had put together called, um, you know, about Jerusalem and Israel. And we went through this book and, and it would tell us these different places and what, why was this significant and what happened in the New Testament in this location, what happened in the Old Testament and all that. So it was, it, it was just a great experience all around. I, and I'd love to go back, just haven't had the chance to go back to Israel. But there was something that marked me on this trip because I had always seen myself as insignificant, insecure, that could never, ever do what I'm doing today because of things I had gone through, things I had faced. And I remember we finished that trip and we, because everywhere you go, whether you're going to Europe or whether you, there's, there's, they want to make money. That's the bottom line. They're there to make money. And as much as they try to make it like scripture, ultimately they're there, get you in their store to make money. And so I'm sitting on our bus, I'm sitting on our tour bus and I'm looking out the window, everyone would have gone in and, and, and they, they wanted to stop at this silver, this jewelry store that specialized in silver from that location. And so most everyone got off the bus except a couple of the, and I just, I'm just, I don't like jewelry. I don't wear jewelry. I just, it's never been something I've ever done. I'm not, I have anything against, you know, jewelry. It's, if that's your thing, that's, it's all good. It's all good. And, and I'm sitting there and, and I'm and plain as day. The Holy Ghost goes, I want you to go in that store. I'm like, I don't want jewelry. Go in the store. <laughs> but 
Why? I don't, I don't want to go into a jewelry store. We, we've been in 3,000 jewelry stores. I mean, Annette and I went to Alaska, and it's like population 800 people in this one town, but they had 30 jewelry stores. It's like, oh, my goodness. So it was like I didn't want to go into another jewelry store. So finally, I'm like, hey, I'm going to go into the jewelry store. I go in the jewelry store, I'm, and I'm walking around, and it was like, okay, okay, God. I mean, jewelry, just like they had at the other 37 stores we went to. And I'm walking around the, the, the counter, and just I had this just, just something in my heart was like, just kind of look down. Sometimes you don't know it's the Lord is just like, why am I looking at this? So I'm looking, and he said, see that ring? I want you to buy that ring. God, you want me to buy a ring? I don't wear jewelry. He said, get the ring, and I'm going to speak to you about the ring. And so I buy the ring. It was, I think, I think it was like $25, I think is what it was, if I remember correctly. I get the ring I, on the bus and pull out the ring. I put it on my finger, and I said, Lord, what is this? And all of a sudden, the presence of God came on me, and to where I started crying weeping and the Lord said he goes David was just an ordinary young man but I did something extraordinary through him because he desired to pursue me he wasn't a perfect man he didn't ever he didn't do everything right but ultimately he had a heart for me. And, and this is what he said. He goes, Justin, if you want to fulfill your assignment upon your life, and for this message today, I'll change that word to legacy. If you want to fulfill the legacy on your life, I want you to wear this ring for the rest of your life because it signifies the fact that you can't fulfill your assignment without me. So 24 years later, I still wear this ring. Amen. It's, it's, two, it's two, cor- two strands of silver that are beaten together and intermingled throughout the whole, the whole ring. And then it's soldered there in the back. And the Lord said, wear this for the rest of your life. And every time you look at it, you, can, you consider it the fact that I'm going to do something extraordinary through your life. I don't say that to elevate me or my experiences or my encounters. The thing is, you have to remember what God has spoken to you. Remember your encounters that you've had with him. Close with this. Years ago, I, you know, as a pastor, you walk through a lot of different things with people. I'm not going to go into great details about this situation or circumstance, but I remember as, as I was walking through this with this particular family, and I was like, Lord, I, I can't seem to do, something doesn't seem to be changing. I know I'm doing, as a pastor, I'm doing everything I can do to make this work. I'm doing everything I can do to help the situation. I'm doing everything I can do. And, and I was trying to, you know, even sometimes you, you want just people to make right choices, right? You can't make your children make right choices. It's like you, you want them to do what you're telling them to do, but it's like if you just, if you would just listen to what I, if you just listen to the words that are coming out of my mouth. <laughs> it's just like if you just... You know, and, and it's like, but no matter what you do, it's just like they still wanted, they, they still would want to do their own thing. And that's how the situation was. And finally, the Holy Spirit said, Justin, you have to stop. You have to stop. Because you can't fix this. Because bottom line is, they're not submitted to me. And this is what the Lord told me. He said, they have to choose between self or reaching the masses. They have to choose beside what they want, what they feel, what they're being directed to do, the, the thing that's, their, that's fueling their flesh. And they have to choose between that or they need to choose, are they going to reach the masses that God had called them to do? And God had an amazing call upon their life. 
I believe still has a call upon their life, but I believe because of those choices, that calling would not operate in its fullest like it could have. The Lord allows as we go forward in this, in legacy, talking about the difference between sanctification and consecration to legacy. But he's looking for a man and he's looking for a woman that he can use. Stand to your feet. Mm.